hospitality of the art collector, I've come to a luxury penthouse apartment overlooking the Thames, owned by one of the world's best-selling novelists. What shall I call you? Jeffrey? Jeffrey. Lord Jeffrey. Jeffrey? Jeffrey. That's very kind. Thanks. This is Sisley. Sisley. I, I love that picture. Is that a pastel? It's a pastel, which is very rare. He painted just over a hundred pastels in his lifetime. And it's one of those rare paintings where I wanted it within seconds of seeing it. Sometimes I debate, think, go back, look a second time. That one I knew immediately. You've got your grubby hands on my beautiful wall. I, I do apologize. Geoffrey Archer is currently 583rd in Britain's rich list. He's had a colorful career. A politician and confidant of Margaret Thatcher, he was made a lord by John Major, but he's also served a prison sentence for perjury. But it's his novels that have allowed him to pursue his passion for collecting art. Not old masters, but 19th century impressionists. Now here you will see one of my philosophies on collecting. Because I can't afford the major impressionists, I buy uh, the next rank down. And they're often just as good, but not as well known. And this is a, a camoir. Well, now, this looks if, like Matisse. Uh, well, or Gauguin. If that was a Gauguin and this was a Van Gogh, you're talking not ten times the price. You're talking a hundred times the price. I suppose... Uh, let's get rid of your coat. Oh, not. thanks. Um, I suppose the big thing about the main room is... The view. Exactly. Which you prefer, your paintings or the view? Oh, no, it's amazing, because when people come here, they immediately say the view. It is hard not just to stand here like this, um, yes, which is which a is shame what, for the collection. Frankly, what most sense. people do. They walk in, they see the view, they forget the pictures completely. I can't help noticing... Uh, you, you talked about having second-rank artists in the corridor in terms of the impressionists, but here is Andy Warhol. Well, is he first-rate? I don't think so. Do you I not? I think he's very expensive now. But I don't think he's a great artist. No, I don't. I do like this. It's not dissimilar, the hairstyle between <laughs> Marilyn and Margaret Thatcher beneath. Yes, they were both powerful women. <laughs> so uh, how much do you think this would be worth now? I have no idea. Don't yeah. be so vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> you called me the vulgarian. Vulgar question. Does the money for buying art come from... This is a golden book. This is the equivalent of going platinum, Cain and Abel. Mm. Yes, that's the breakthrough. If that's what you're getting at in your continued vulgar way. Yes, it was Cain and Abel that made it possible for me to have the collection I have. My favourite picture, in a way, is this one, the Albert Goodwin, often compared as an artist to Turner. And what you see there, of course, is he must have painted it from just over there. And it's the amazing golds and the amazing colours. At night, when the sun is coming over it, it looks magnificent. When did you buy it? Oh, 30 years ago. So you've been collecting for several decades? I've been collecting for 50 years. Let's face it, if you get into this mad world, it's like drugs. <laughs> you don't... You have to have another one. You have to have another fix. I mean, it's just awful. And you, wherever you see something you can just about afford, you just about afford it. Your country collectors are all stupid and mad. And collectors really go mad for the artist at number seven in our top ten. And I'll explain why we've jumped to seven in a moment. No one quite captures the imagination like Claude Monet, the prince of the Impressionists. He spent the second half of his life depicting his gardens at Giverny, especially the water lilies, which he painted obsessively. Most of them are in museums, so when a good one comes on the market, it creates a frenzy. At number seven in my top ten, it's Monet's water lily pond, going for $80,379,591. And I'm with Tanya Poss, who bid for the painting and won. Well, Tanya, tell me about the night that you bid $80 million for this painting. Well, where to start? I knew that this painting was going to outshine its, its estimate, and there was a lot of competition in the room. I knew that it was a very important piece for Monet because uh, of his water lily series that he painted consecutively for 26 years. Although that, that's the question I wanted to ask yeah. because there's so many of these paintings. What's special about this one that well, means it's worth so much? First of all, of his late water lilies, few are signed. And this is a completed late version signed by the artist. We should make clear that you weren't buying this for yourself. You were buying this for somebody else. Yes. 
Who are you buying it for? I will never say. <laughs> God, that's tantalising stuff. Confidentiality is part of my job. What is it that motivates some of these collectors to spend this amount on works of art? Well, I think um, the people I work with are surrounded by quality in their lives, so why would it stop in their art collecting? They, they wish to have the very best, and they want to be surrounded by the very best, whether it's their home, their car, their planes. I mean, it's, it's just the way they live their lives. Take a good look at the painting. It's appeared only once in public in the last 80 years, and since the auction, hasn't been seen again. And this brings me to the story of the shocking disappearance of the next two paintings in our top ten. The most popular postcard sold by the National Gallery is this one. It's a reproduction of a still life of a vase of sunflowers painted by Vincent van Gogh in 1888. You can see that, in reality, it's much more luminous and radiant. This is one of the most famous paintings in the world, and if it ever came onto the market, it would sell for an insane amount of money. But it won't. But when the highest achievements by some of our greatest artists do appear at auction, then the art market can be influenced by much more than simply love of the painting. That's exactly what happened in the heady days just before the stock market crash of 1990, when two paintings sold within days of each other, Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet at Christie's and Au Moulin de la Galette by Pierre-Auguste Renoir at Sotheby's. Number eight and number six in my top ten, purchased in a mad two-day spending spree by the same collector. In the late 80s, buying art had become a muscular, masculine pursuit. Buying the best was like big game hunting, only to be attempted by the bravest with the deepest pockets. It was a rampaging bull market, and prices were being forced up by the new kids on the art block. The Japanese. All done, everyone else. $71 million, congratulations. The man with the biggest wallet in the room was a paper tycoon, Ryoe Saito. Intensely eccentric and secretive, no one knew whether he'd bought both paintings for love or solely as an investment because he spirited them away, out of sight even from his own family. The man who sold Portrait of Dr. Gachet is legendary auctioneer Christopher Burge. He sold more of the paintings in this film than anyone else. I want to discover more about the role and power of auctioneers and how they steer prices skywards in all the excitement of the auction room. This is the Woods Room, which is the second of our um, sale rooms here, the smaller of the two, where we conduct most of our auctions. I would say 90% of all our auctions take place in here. And this, of course, is the room in which we are about to give you an auction lesson. This is where I'm going to learn the, the trade. This is where you're going to learn the trade. My, a, a large staff will be assembling fairly soon to act as bidders, telephone bidders, sales clerks, and the rest of it, just as if it were an auction. I thought it was just going to be you and me. No, 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 no. Let's begin with lot 327, a sculpture by Rodan. Do I have any bids at 24,000 in the room? Do I have 28? Thank you, madam. $28,000. $30,000. Thank you even more. I tend for months before these big sales to, to have anxiety dreams about the auctions. Do you still get nervous? Oh, God, terrified. Um, more so, actually, the, the, the more I do it, the more nervous I get. Do I have $150,000 in the room? Someone? Anyone in the room? Anyone at all? I'm not getting much love from the room. Art dealers, collectors, hangers-on, most of them, frankly, would love to see something go wrong. It's quite gladiatorial, <laughs> the whole thing. You get the feeling that the thumbs are sort of like this and will very quickly do go like that if the auctioneer makes a hideous mistake. Would you like to pay $55,000? It's against you, sir, $55,000. I know your habits. I can sometimes get an extra bid, $55,000. <laughs> Just a Once you get into the swing of the auction, it's easy to lose sight of the numbers and the reality of the sums at stake. 
Sold to this madam, uh, this lady over here, $58,000. But as Burge concedes, occasionally prices in the auction room are not just about the paintings. Doesn't it happen in auctions that sometimes prices go so high that people afterwards applaud? Only once was there ever sustained applause for a lot that I sold, and that was for the uh, Van Gogh portrait of Dr. Gachet. When it was sold, uh, and, and I hammered it down at $82.5 million, which was then the world record price for, for any work of art, there was you know, sustained applause. People leapt to their feet, they cheered and yelled. And this applause went on for several minutes, which is completely unheard of in, in an auction. The reason everybody applauded, I, I believe, is because we had a very serious financial situation developing in 1990. All sorts of things were collapsing, and the Japanese buyers, who'd been the mainstay of the market, were beginning to get nervous and were pulling out, and everybody was convinced that the market was going to tumble. And that lot, for a moment, stayed the collapse, as it were. And I think what everybody was applauding, they were applauding out of relief that they had saved their money. And you know, my feeling was one of, I have to admit it, really great distaste. It was extremely uncomfortable. I almost felt like just walking off while this applause was going on and just going off stage and not returning. They weren't applauding for Van Gogh. They weren't applauding for the work of art. They were applauding for money. Whatever Saito's motives were for buying the Van Gogh and the Renoir, he faced financial ruin soon afterwards. Extraordinarily, he threatened to burn the paintings rather than sell them. In 1996, he died, and the paintings haven't been seen since. Some genuinely believe he carried out his threat to reduce them to ashes. Others think they were secretly sold to pay his debts. Either way, they've passed into art world mythology. Just imagine the prices they'd achieve if they ever appeared again. Number five in our top ten is by a painter known for his brutal, difficult work. And it brings me to London's Chelsea, where millionaires live behind metal gates and brick walls. So many millionaires, in fact, that it's easy to get the wrong house. There, there they are, Francis Bacon, that's right. These are not genuine, sadly. Oh. Mr Jagger, are they? Um, Mr. Abramovich owns them. Well, would you believe it? We've got the wrong house. I'm going to have to take them. Can you show me? Yeah. Well, that's where the garden is, there. This one. So I should be putting these copies along here. Yeah. Yeah. A triptych is a series of three paintings. That's two. I have a third. This one is by a famous British artist called Francis Bacon that sold at auction in 2008 for $86,281,000, which puts it at number five in our list of the most expensive paintings in the world. And there's a reason why I'm propping them up against a wall in Chelsea in the middle of London. Behind me is a house that belongs to the Russian billionaire and owner of Chelsea FC, Roman Abramovich. And the rumours are that he bought the real triptych back in 2008. I have a very strong hunch that the real triptych is actually hanging in that house behind me. At number five, Francis Bacon's triptych, which sold at Sotheby's in New York in 2008. Bacon's paintings are rising fast. Another work went for three times its estimate earlier this year, but they're not easy to look at. Bacon was a hard drinker and heavy gambler who painted a series of grisly triptychs, and this is one of the goriest and best. Just look at those horrific winged creatures pecking at a mangled carcass. You'd have to be made of stern stuff to enjoy staring at this above your mantelpiece. Maybe Roman Abramovich bought the triptych to impress his girlfriend, Dasha Zukova, who recently opened an art gallery in Moscow. His purchases have not gone unnoticed. He also paid a record-breaking price for another artist, Lucian Freud, who's now officially Britain's most expensive living artist, thanks to Abramovich. Roman Abramovich is notoriously shy and declined my request to have a look at his mantelpiece and stare at his bacon. I have tracked down the daughter of another oligarch, though, Maria Bybikova, herself a collector, to find out why Abramovich and the oligarchs are descending on the art market. During communism, we actually couldn't 
go out and buy